Welcome back ladies and gentlemen, in this video we are going to talk about our good friend Fareed responds. Now about a week ago Fareed made a video where he put out a challenge where he said this. And actually I'd like to challenge um, the Christian polemicists to provide an example of a classical Muslim scholar that held the view that the Torah is fully preserved. Oh, and I'm kind enough to let you know that I'm familiar with the types of statements that you're going to bring to argue that classical Muslim scholars believed in the preservation of the Old Testament and New Testament. But yeah, go for it. Let's see what happens. Now, me, David Wood, and Jai were more than happy to address that claim. I approached it from the perspective of the Injil, and Jai approached it from the perspective of the Torah, and David just gave his commentary throughout. Well, what does this mean? Again, it means that the classical Muslim scholars that took the Qur'an at face value understood the Qur'an in the same way that modern Muslims do today. So Farid says that these scholars, they didn't believe that the Injil of the Torah was preserved, but they did believe that certain verses were preserved. In other words, they were cherry picking, according to Farid, according to their own beliefs. They would take what they don't like, take what they do like, and that's good enough. No, the early classical Muslim scholars were more intelligent than that Farid. What they would do is they would understand the dilemma they were in. On the one hand, the Quran affirms the Injil and the Torah as an authoritative, inspired, and preserved document that the Jews and the Christians at that time of Muhammad had to follow, and if they didn't, they would be accountable to Allah for not following it, as your Quran says in many places. Surah al 47, Surah al 68, Surah al 43, Surah 10, 94, and so on and so on. That they knew that they just couldn't make blanket statements about the Qur'an just being completely, and in a general sense, textually falsified at the time of Muhammad. This also would be problematic given verses like 7157, Surah 61 Ayah 6, where there seems to be mention of Muhammad in prior scriptures. Those scriptures were being affirmed at the time of Muhammad, therefore, they should be there. Now the best way to explain this, while still being able to make use of information that is in prior scriptures that the Quran came to affirm, is to say that the Christians and the Jews have misunderstood or misinterpreted their scriptures. This is Talif al-Mana, and you can find this in the very early classical Muslim scholars who talk about issues of Tarif. In fact, what's interesting is I've not found a single example that was clear-cut of an early Muslim scholar claiming that the Torah and Injil were generally, universally corrupted textually, as in they were textually falsified before the 11th century. I haven't found that. I'll be very interested to see you, Farid, if you can demonstrate that such a thing exists, because going through the article you listed on your video was not very impressive. So let's look at the article that Farid Responds used when he made his video and what he's referring to. Farid's article helpfully has a section called Evidence from the Statements of Early Muslims. So it should be easy for us to see exactly what he's getting and how he's making this argument. How is he able to demonstrate that the early classical scholarly position in Islam was that the Injil and the Torah were generally and universally corrupt. So here's an example of just poor reasoning. He gives an example of a hadith that supposedly goes back to someone who converted to Islam at the time of Muhammad and was explaining what was inside the Torah or the Injil. They then say, aha, the Torah or the Injil today does not have this particular description in it. That must mean that the Torah and the Injil have been corrupted textually, universally, and generally across the world. That doesn't really follow. There's a much more simpler and easier and avoids having to have some sort of conspiracy level theory that the Injil and the Torah were changed by the Jews and the Christians across the world in many different languages at some point in time that was agreed upon by both the Christians and the Jews as some sort of super world order government that changed the prior scriptures. No, you can avoid all of this. You can simply say, well, it seems as if the Quran is wrong. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, that this is the basic level. It's if the Quran says something that you cannot find in the scriptures and it tells you that you should be able to find them in the scriptures at the time of Muhammad and we have manuscripts of the time of Muhammad and before, then the Quran is in error. It's very basic and very simple. It doesn't require, like I said, grand conspiracy theories. You can just read the text as it is, evaluate it accordingly, and come to the conclusion it's wrong. And hence, the Quran is not from Allah, and hence it is not divine revelation. So the guy that wrote this article did a lot of these kind of styles of argumentation from early scholars. He basically just thinks that every time a scholar says something incorrect about the Torah and the Injil, that's proof of the Quran. But most people would just think it's proof that he didn't know what the Torah or the Injil was. Uh, that's the common sense interpretation. But again, we're not having the luxury of common sense when we talk about these issues. 
Okay, so we come to our first actual tafsir work of someone of whom is giving their actual informed opinion as part of the classical early scholars of Islam. This is Muqattal ibn Suleiman, which is interesting because this is the same person that I quoted in my video response as not supporting the idea of a general, universal, textual falsification of the Torah and the Injil, but rather either tarif al manner, so corruption of the meaning or the, the understanding, the Christians and Jews were just saying things, not understanding what they were saying, that didn't really correlate with the text. And also the idea that the Jews, according to Surah al Baqarah 79, their understanding of it, were altering words by hiding them from their places, like the description of Muhammad, or the verse of stoning, for example, and would even write their own books or their own copies of the Torah, or of some other book, which supersedes the original Torah that they still have in their possession, and they sell that for a little gain, namely to avoid the consequences of having to accept Muhammad's prophethood. But you'll notice here that these two views are not the same thing as what Ibn Hazm later derives in the 11th century, the conspiratory theory that the Injil and Torah were corrupted by the Jews and the Christians at some point before Muhammad, universally, in many different languages, and they also destroyed the oral tradition. I mean, that is ultimately what Muslims today want you to believe. They want you to believe that there has been some kind of universal conspiratory level corruption of their own scriptures. Because again, the Injil and the Torah, in their perspective, are Muslim scriptures, are Islamic scriptures, and they believe they have been corrupted worldwide. How such a thing is possible or plausible, I think is... I mean, I, I wouldn't want to have to bet my life on that being the case. Let's put it that way. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't want to bet very much at all on that being the case because it seems like only the mind of a madman would ever come to the idea that you could alter a text and an old tradition from two separate groups across the world simultaneously to eliminate completely entire written and oral traditions. That to me sounds bizarre. And I have a funny feeling Muqattal ibn Suleiman and ibn Ishaq and ibn Qutaba and al yakubi I have a funny feeling they all thought that same way because, yeah, you... <laughs> the early Muslims had every reason to hold to the idea that the Christian and Jewish scriptures were inspired, preserved, and authoritative, but that the Christians and the Jews were misrepresenting them, misinterpreting them, hiding them, altering them in their own little collections to sell to others for little gain. That makes complete sense. In fact, that seems a reasonable approach if you want to take it that way. But that's not what Muslims today think. And again, it changed with Ibn Hazm in the 11th century. We went from widespread, according to Martin Akkad, usage of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John within the first three centuries of Islam as being the proof texts that Muslims can read to try to figure out where Muhammad is mentioned or to gather any additional biographical information on either Musa or Isa. We went from that to just actually they are not reconcilable. We went from a period of time where Muslims thought that perhaps you could reconcile these by just saying that Jews and Christians understood them wrong to no, we can't reconcile these. There is no way that our doctrines of Islam can possibly be reconciled with the Torah and the Injil. Take for example, the doctrine of Isma, the idea that the prophets are sinless in Islam. This is not found in the Quran and it's not found in the Sunnah. In fact, the very opposites are found in the Quran and Sunnah. And it is a later derived doctrine that did not start at the time of Muhammad. By the time this doctrine is formulated, we get to the 11th century where Ibn Hazm is using it as evidence for the fact that we cannot say that the Matthew, Mark, Luke and John of today have not been corrupted generally and universally. Because to say that it isn't is to in effect say that the Quran contradicts itself. It affirms the Injil, but the Injil doesn't affirm it. This is what we call being stuck between a rock and a hard place. There are very little options for Muslim scholars to go to, but really, the overwhelming amount of positive verses that talk about the Torah and the Injil and the Quran vastly outnumber the number of negative verses that imply some form of altercation to the Torah and the Injil. Which again, Martin Whittingham has demonstrated in his book A History of the Muslim Views of the Bible. Next, we get to another category of early Muslim scholars, which is an interesting word to use at this point, but we'll go with it, is mentioning scholars that are from the 13th, 14th, 15th century as early scholars. That's not really what I meant by early, Farid. That's not what I meant by early. You can't, 
That's like me saying, I'm quoting an early Bible scholar to you, and I quote someone in the 7th century. Al-Qutubi, as this guy references, is the 13th century. That's not an early scholar. Neither is Ibn Kathir, neither is Ibn Taymiyyah. These are not early scholars. These are all after Ibn Hazm, after the 11th century, when Muslim scholars decided, hey, we don't really have a choice we figured out what these, <laughs> what the what this Injil and the Torah says, and it seems as if it's causing us more damage in our interactions with Christians by trying to affirm it than by putting something in place to deny it. And that's when it changed. To the Torah and the Injil have been preserved, but the Christians have misunderstood them and have written their own alternate versions in little places and sold them. To actually know the very core heart of the Torah and the Injil itself has been textually falsified. There is a huge world of difference between those two opinions, Farid. And with that, we've actually gone through the examples that give some supposed early scholars. Now, some were early. Muqat al-Ibn Suleiman was the first tafsir writer that we have in Arabic that has survived to this day, which is pretty awesome. But the others are either Hadith material, which works on the assumption that whatever the Hadith or the Quran says is de facto true, you compare it to something else, that doesn't say the same, so that's false. That's faulty, right? But I'm not quite done yet, Farid. I want to look at your quotations of Al-Tabari, who again, as we know, is a 10th century author, or 9th century if you if you think like class when he's born in. But let's see his opinion. David didn't bother to show his audience these quotes, or any quotes, to substantiate his claim, because none of these scholars say anything explicit about the Old and New Testament being preserved. Let's read this quote that you put up on screen. Tabari takes the position that the tarif, the corruption, was done by a group of people at the time of Moses. A group of people, Farid, who heard the word of God from Moses, but having heard and understood, altered it. Now think about this logically, Farid. We know from the Quran that Isa affirms the Torah that was with them in Jerusalem at the time of his coming. Therefore, the Torah cannot be corrupt at this point. That's not possible according to the Quranic timeline. Because Isa affirms the validity of the Torah at his time, in his hands, that he was even taught, we must believe that the Torah has not been corrupted by the time of Isa, according to the Quran. If you believe that the Torah has been generally and universally textually falsified in many ways at this point, then you've gone against your own Quran. So the Tabari didn't know this, which seems really bizarre to me, or his view was a lot more nuanced than you're making it seem. The nuance is very simple. At the time of Musa, there are many Jews, part of the ulamas, as he says, that altered the words either through saying them, or hiding them, or withdrawing them, or covering them, or, check this out for read, the Jews could have also written separate documents claiming that to be the Torah and then selling it for a little gain. Now, none of those actions are actually corrupting or textually falsifying the Torah in a universal and general way. Because again, to my knowledge, not a single classical early Muslim scholar believed that the Torah or the Injil had been generally or universally textually falsified until the 11th century. And again, he puts another screenshot on screen where he shows different quotes supposedly attributed to Al-Tabari, where he supposedly says the Torah or the Injil is universally and generally textually falsified. Is that what we find? No. It's not sufficient for you, Fareed, to demonstrate general textual falsification just by appealing to the fact that people wrote alternative things, or people altered things. For example, I could take a Bible, and I wouldn't, but I could, and I could just write things in it. That might have textually falsified that Bible. How much so would depend on what I changed, and also whether or not it was sufficient enough to actually change the meaning, which is another question. But, assuming I did this, have I textually corrupted the Bible? No, Farid. Likewise for your Quran. If I took a Quran and I wrote some stuff in it, have I textually falsified all of the Qurans in the world? No. In order to textually modify the meaning that is present within a text, you have to do it sufficiently enough that you actually change it across the entire landscape of the known communities that use that particular work. For example, the Jews use the Torah, right? So to corrupt the Torah textually, you need to basically get, let's say, the majority of Torahs, and you need to change them all in exactly the same place, without anyone noticing you're doing this, at the same time, in multiple different languages, in multiple different parts of the world, that are often separated by hundreds or if not thousands of miles. So practically speaking, this isn't a plausible theory. It isn't a plausible idea. It's the mainstream Islamic one, because you don't have anything else. But just to look at it from a logic perspective, there is no way you can rationalize this as being sensible or even sane. You then go on to do the same thing with Al-Razi. Again, there's nothing in here that says that there is a general and universal 
textual falsification of the Torah and the Injil. You kind of get that stuff with Ibn Kathir, like your article showed, or al qutbi like your article showed, or Ibn Taymiyyah, like your article showed. Although interestingly, as I mentioned in a previous video, there is actually quotes from Ibn Taymiyyah that even he seems to suggest that the majority of Muslims do concede that the majority of the Injil the Christians have today is still accepted as not being corrupt and as being reliable, even in his time in the 14th century. Now let's look at what Freed has to say about the kind of criteria he's looking for. Let's watch this. So Ibn Hazm passed away 450 years after the Prophet, peace be upon him. So we shouldn't have any trouble finding tens of scholars that affirm this. Um, okay, Farid, you want a list of scholars. I don't know why you want 10. I mean, your paper in terms of early scholars gave one, <laughs> gave some that were not early at all, gave one that was early, but that agrees with my position. And then the rest was just things like hadith material, which is useless anyway, because the more simple, more plain, more common sense in all honesty approach is just that the hadith is wrong. If the hadith says the Injil used to talk about teenage mutant ninja turtles and Power Rangers, I'm going to assume that's wrong. And I'm going to assume that whoever says that it used to say that is wrong. Likewise with your Hadith. Since there is no evidence to back up these claims textually or orally from a Jewish or Christian origin, I'm pretty sure that was never there. The burden of proof is on you to demonstrate there is evidence to substantiate that claim. So you give it, I'm just going to cast it out. To end this video, real simple. Farid, to prove me wrong and to debunk what I'm saying, it's very simple. You need to demonstrate one case in writing that is not Ibn Kathir, that's not Ibn Taymiyyah, that's not al qurtubi not later scholars, medieval scholars, I'm talking about classical early scholars, that said they believe the Torah and the Injil have been universally, generally, textually falsified to the point where it changes the meaning from what it originally meant when it was sent down to Musa and to Isa, respectively. If you can't show me this, Farid, then I am forced to take all of the statements that they do make, such as Tarif al mana corruption of the meaning or the interpretation, Tarif al or writing the words in their own hands to then sell for a little gain, while still having and using the uncorrupt Torah and the Injil to do that, those are the methods I'm left with. And those are the methods that I'm going to say the early scholars believed in until later on after the 11th century. That's my challenge to you, Farid. You're going to need to find a new article because this one certainly doesn't do the job. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, God bless you all. If you're not a Christian yet, then today is the day. Email me at chrisatspeakerscorner at gmail.com. Have an amazing day. That includes you, Farid. God bless you all and take care. Bye-bye.